Mugibi. Sorry. Uh, Eric Kanyane Mugibi. Eric. Eric Kanyane Mugibi. Okay. Uh, question for Dr. Rob Steven. I was actually mind blown by your global grid. And then I just had a question in terms of the ownership, the regulation. Um, I'll, I'll actually give an example of a grounding project which has been stalled for quite a number of years. And just in terms of ownership and governance and who owns what asset for your, for your global grid. Uh, you talked about the separating of the distribution wires business from the retail business and your suggestion was that Eskom take on the wires business in a sort of a national grid and that the municipalities handle the retail business. Um, my, my question really is, are municipalities really <laughs> innovative enough in the retail space to take up this. And wouldn't it be better for the retail part of this business to be handled in a competitive environment, firstly, certainly not excluding municipalities, but uh, I believe it must include the, the retail sector that can put together really innovative bundles of benefits, which may include you know, DSTV and airtime, electricity, uh, Packages like we see in the mobile space, uh, the mobile data space, where you know you get free minutes here, free minutes there. In the electricity space, you could get free electricity on a Sunday, or you know, free electricity between midnight and three o'clock in the morning. Uh, and 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 what this really takes is a really uh, innovative marketing approach that understands customers and groups of customers and bundling together packages of benefits. And I'm just not sure that, that municipalities have got a clue when it comes to retail. And I think they'll be completely out of their depth, although nothing to stop them from participating in the sector, but to limit it to, to municipalities, I think would be doing the country a great disservice. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Walter, I'm retired, and I own my own opinions. <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions for Professor Barry and for Professor uh, Foral. The first one to Barry, your discussion of the fourth industrial revolution definition was very interesting. I'd just like to say to you that I prefer another famous South African scientist, a scientist, Christopher Henshelwood, He's busy digging out skeletons in the Bombos case as we speak right now. He says the fourth industrial evolution started right there. And it's been just a continuous process. And I think if we change our insights and stop homo technologicals, I think it is, that has influenced the opinion, we might get it right. But on your question, uh, uh, for you specifically, I'm very familiar. I first met you at the Chimologum Center. Uh, How's it going? Yeah. Because I have a worry about the concept of innovation hubs. We have about 55% of our population living under the poverty line. How do we bring them up to speed? The more short, small successes <coughs> we have in innovation hubs, like what you've started, by the way, is just fueling inequality. We, we, if we don't deal with the mass needs, and just deal with the specialists from our Model C schools and our private schools and so forth, we are doomed. We have to look at the big picture. Now that's to follow well, up what's happening with the Jimorogo precincts and where can they go to from there. For Dr. Rob, your expertise is fascinating. Now you say that, you know, our energy uh, sector demands a broadband information systems for it to control itself and to manage itself. And yet, every single uh, power reticulation, energy reticulation system, including the 1,100 volt thing that you showed in China, whether it's cable, whether it's overhead, or whatever the case may be, has got immense capacity to deliver broadband itself, which you can use and which the public can use, but we don't do it. You know that in South Africa, for example, China municipality, has been looking at embedding fiber optic in the earth wires on the 132 kV lines. They go through townships. They don't stop there. How do we manage every single 650 volt or 
11 kV line in rural areas. It, I, think, I think the price of a fiber is about five rand a meter, something like that, you know. It's very, very cheap. But the excavation cost to lay fiber is in the region of 3,000 rand a meter. And yet, every single power line, cable or overhead, in South Africa has tremendous capacity to deliver broadband everywhere. Even to the remotest rural area, we've got a power link somewhere nearby. Why don't we do it? If you can, please, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, there, were, there were two questions. The one was the, the, the governance or ownership of the, uh, of the super grid. Well, it's the same principle as you would have for normal grids. And uh, <laughs> the, 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 the ownership, in fact, uh, around the world has, has, has changed. It used to be utility ownership. If you look at Brazil now, they've actually got auctions uh, for each line. So you can have ABB owning a line um, and they will maintain and provide the service over that line with a, and they get paid for the energy going over the line and reliability factors. So the, the, the ownership doesn't have to be a utility base. The aim that they're looking at here is more, um, it's not the ownership as such. The investors can put in and there's a, there's a way to get over the, uh, the, the, the power going over the line. They'll get compensated for that and the reliability. They'll get either penalized or, or rewarded for the reliability of that particular asset. But in addition to that, they're looking at um, benefit to the country because the whole thing is around politics more than anything else. And uh, if you can get the, the, the benefit to the country, uh, they, 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 they feel that they can actually get solutions. So that looks at uh, electrification in the areas, especially looking up through the Congo, going up to Egypt. Um, it looks at uh, revenue from the actual assets from the, from the hydro or whatever uh, source of generation they can find and, and, and things like that. So it's, it's, it's not something which is... Uh, hasn't been done somewhere else in the world. There are different owner models, and you can have an asset owner, uh, you can have uh, then, a, then a maintenance contract, you can have an a, a energy trader as well. So you can have many parties dealing with the one asset. You don't have to have, a, have one owner does everything. So there's, there's, there's lots of models that you can actually use, use for that. So that's not really the main uh, issue uh, at this point. And then the other one on, on fibre, yes, we've actually looked at that. It's the, um, the, I was hoping to actually put MV fibre into MV lines using a, 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 it's an OPPC a cable, which is, is fibre in the conductor, which is livened up. Um, there, 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 there are issues around licences, there's issues around how you actually um, uh, take that now from the live fiber into the particular home. So there are technical issues as well, but it's not only fiber, it's also a power line carrier you can use uh, from the um, particular uh, a device. In fact, a lot of the smart meters use a power line carrier to get your uh, customer interface units so that you can see what's happening on, the, on this thing. But that can then be used for voice over IP, internet, whatever else. So I think it's something uh, which, which definitely we, we, we should be looking at. It's a, it comes a lot down to, uh, to, to regulation. Can the utility actually now enter the, 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 the communications and get funding from communications and stuff like that? And uh, the, the, uh, the, in, 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 in the other parts of the world, a lot of the revenue for the utilities is actually more from uh, data communications than from power sales. So it's, it's definitely something which is, uh, which is, which is technically feasible and, and something that, that can be looked at. But it needs to be looked at as a, as a holistic thing with a full regulation framework that's stable and we can actually um, really start opening up for data and power. And as uh, Chris was saying, then if you can get uh, aggregators and DSOs in, which are all privatized in most of the world anyway, they can then come up with a lot of different products. So you could by having the, the communications and your, and your product, you can say, well, in this particular case, we can give you, um, you know, Netflix plus, a, if you have that, you'll have a lower electricity bill or a higher data bill or whatever the story is. So there's a lot of options that you can start looking at. And our mobile networks, are in fact, uh, are very good examples of that. We just got to marry the, marry the thing. I don't, I don't think it's impossible. The suggestion to, firstly, to break up Eskom or 
in, in the restructure of ESCOM to consider the idea of maybe a regulated grid. So if you look at our current situation, you know, asset management is not happening. Right? At the municipal level, it's certainly not happening. Right? It, it happens probably at ESCOM and some of the, the larger metros. Right? So asset management is a problem. And having one entity deal with the entire grid is, is, is one of the benefits of such a proposal. Then, standardization. That's not happening. You know, NRS is there. It was created to support uh, the grid standardization. But municipalities do their own things. Right. Then you don't have the skills and the competence sitting out there technically within the municipalities to even talk about smart grids. I mean, a head of electricity is uh, probably just simple electricians today. <coughs> and uh, that picture, you know, you need a design engineer who actually understands these con concepts to be sitting there, taking those decisions, and that is, doesn't exist today. Now, when we look at... So, we abandoned, firstly, the EDI restructuring in 2010. And it was largely done on the basis that if you took electricity out of the municipality, you could kill the municipality. It will die. Because the funding, the, f the electricity revenue, actually sustains, cost subsidizes the services. Now we have uh, an, indi an indi indigenous society in South Africa growing. It's going to get worse. right? And s uh, somehow we have to at least deal with this <coughs> issue of just transition long term. So you need the municipalities to work. Simple. As a developing country, we do not we cannot have the luxury of separating the electricity out out of the municipalities. We need it to really support the cross subsidization and deal with <coughs> the issues of just transition in our country. Uh, then uh, Added to that, if you want to move down this path, you have to consider the issues of the, the Constitution. This is this, uh, you know, election, in fact, ESCOM and, 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 and some of the uh, other entities within government have been, you know, in this debate about the constitutionality of, of municipalities and, and ESCOM in, in the reticulation business. Now, the Constitution is quite clear in that space that it, it be, uh, reticulation is the responsibility of municipalities. So if you want to change that now, you're going to have to change the law. Uh, so that is another area that doesn't allow for it. Now, there's been talk of a, a, a service delivery agreement between ESCOM and the municipalities, and that makes it work. We've had issues around things like notified maximum demand, where municipalities don't even know that they exceeding the notified maximum demand, get huge bills as a result of it, and half of them didn't even know that that was actually the case. If, if ESCOM managed the grid all the way to the meter, that all of those issues go away. Right? And then to deal with the, uh, the apportionment of the funding, I think you could clearly uh, have the municipalities collect that because the <coughs> issue of of payment is, is crucial in this uh, aspect. The issue of affordability is also very important, and that so resides with the councils of municipalities to ensure that the uh, the people in their uh, constituents actually pay. Right. So, for me, uh, the municipalities dealing with retail makes perfect sense because they can manage it. And then the grid is managed by ESCOM, run by ESCOM, standardized by ESCOM, maintained by ESCOM, and that ensures reliability, efficiency, and so on. Thank you. Uh, one was about the uh, revolution versus evolution. Now, I think that wasn't a question, it was a comment. And I, I do agree with you, Walter, that uh, you know, I think this idea of industrial revolutions, 
of things we only discover after the fact. So maybe one day our grandchildren will look back at this age and say, oh, there was an industrial revolution that had these aspects and would identify it with hindsight. So I think as we live through things, we are evolving. It's evolution. I don't see any revolution. Maybe the one revolutionary thing we're seeing now that we're doing quite a lot with the bits is quantum computing, which is really a whole new paradigm in terms of how computers work and the problems they'll solve. And that could be revolutionary in terms of what it does, but there are very few of those things. So I do agree with you, this terminology, we should drop this idea of 4IR, I think, and just talk about digital transformation of society and business and other things. In terms of um, technology hubs or, or incubation, um, and I didn't really speak about it in my uh, talk, but it was mentioned in the introduction that I've been involved since 2013 in setting up a digital innovation precinct in Bramfontein, which we call the Timolochong uh, Digital Innovation Precinct. And it's Wits University's digital <coughs> precinct. And it, it's kind of based on the principle of an ecosystem. So I think that I, and I do agree with you, Walter, that um, the idea of, of incubation hubs or, or, or incubators is not, a, not viable. You can't put something in the belt and say, this is an incubator, bring your ideas here and we'll turn them into successful businesses. I think it, it has to be part of an ecosystem and within that ecosystem, new, you can bring new ideas and some of, those, some of those ideas might grow into new businesses which will create opportunities and jobs. And in terms of um, Simola Khom, it is an ecosystem, so we've got very important partnerships between WITS and UJ, which, is, which are two major research universities. We've got um, City of Joburg, Provis, and a whole number of companies, including um, IBM Research and others. And people that bring ideas there have the possibility of taking those ideas further, but it's really, quite specific ideas in digital innovation that we can support. And the real intention, that, my real intention in setting it up was to deal with technology transfer out of a research intensive university like WITS. So WITS, if you walk around WITS and look at the earth shattering research that's going on, and most of it lands up in a thesis in a paper in a book chapter somewhere, but not as a new product creating new value and new impact. And this is a way to try and bring tech transfer into our research ecosystem and, and um, try to spin off companies. But it's not really dealing with the mass of people out there who should be thinking entrepreneurially and creating jobs for themselves and their community. I don't know if that is. Suppose it's a, a matter of objective for why you set it up, yeah. as opposed to the need that Walter is expressing, which is very valid. Yeah. Could I just maybe say one thing is that we, we, um, we, we've got a plan to kind of, uh, to, to create a hub and spoke model <coughs> where the BITS Innovation Hub will have um, satellites in various areas where we bring the <laughs> ecosystem into those areas, but that hasn't yet happened. Please um, say your name. I'm Jose. I have a question for Tim. Um, could you expand on the limitations of, of blockchain, in particular the speed and maybe the energy use? Some of them are there. I'm, I'm Greek. Um, and some of my <coughs> questions, if you want to put it questions or not necessary questions, also comments to the panel as, as a whole. Um, I'm one of the ESCOM guys that was at one stage in ESCOM and said, hey, I'm out of here. That was quite a number of years ago. 
And um, what we've done is um, we've gone and gone into communities where municipalities can't go to and where Eskom can't go to because of financial constraints. And we've set up micro generation substations, if you want to call it that, using renewable energies. Very successful, it is working. It's below, below the level, so um, it becomes the ownership of the community immediately. So the question of selling energy, that's, that's where we're in. But um, the, one, the one point that I wanted to make and, and I wanted to ask is, um, do, especially on, that, on, on the lines and the municipality, and um, that I agree 100% that the grid should be owned if it is going right up to the meter of the house by a utility and the marketing should take place. Do the municipalities, from your experience, somebody on that panel, are they prepared to accept the, the fact that they cannot, or that we know they can't, but are they prepared to support this type of product that we are supplying to these communities? And one of the places that we're busy doing it right now is, funny enough, where they just burnt down Eskom Lines, just near the old line park. We're now going in there and we're going to actually sort that problem out for them. Um, and, but, but we get a, a bit of opposition because now the problem comes in, you can't do it because of X, Y, and Z. But we do it and we make the community own it. There are investors, they do get their money back. It's a very structured system. And that's the question I need to ask. So the, the, the whole chain that we're doing is, is we are selling energy, we're also reticulating, we're doing it all within the safety constraints and the law of the country. Um, and we're basically cutting out the municipalities and Eskom and we're telling the community, Eskom's not coming here, the municipalities aren't coming here, you guys own your own network and you run your own network. So it makes them self-sufficient. When they've paid it off, they then get the money that's coming in extra after that and they can do other things in that area, even build soccer fields, clinics, etc., etc. That's what we're doing. So it's, it's more of a comment that I'm making, but there were a couple of little bit of questions in there, just something to think about. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Rob Jeffrey. I'm former MD of Econometrics. Somebody said it earlier, we have huge poverty in this country and it's going to increase. Our economic growth rate is below 1% and it's unlikely to rise above 2%. And by the year 2035, we're going to have more than 16 million new people entering the workforce at current growth rates all we're going to get is about four or five million new jobs. So we have a real problem and we need urgently to re-industrialize and develop our mining sectors to give us a chance in going forward. That's in the NDP. For that, they need security of supply and also at a low cost. And it means baseload power. Baseload power has not gone away because that is about 40 or 50 percent of the supply that is required. Now, it would appear to me that the risk of failure uh, rises in proportional to the time uh, that one moves towards renewables and a microgrid, which looks rather futuristic, it will come, I have no doubt about it, that's the right direction as RA and D. But we need the growth in the next 10 or 15 years, not in 20, 25 years' time when people are trying to uh, have perfected this microgrids and so on. And uh, somebody on the panel said, talked about, it's a, about one aspect and said it was a pie in the sky. I'm just saying, what is this going to bring to economic growth going forward? If, and that is a question for somebody on the panel to to ask. Risk is going to rise and it's going to make no uh, difference to the growth rate, critical growth rate required over the next 15, 20 years. And my final point is, it would appear to me, and somebody can answer this, Eskom doesn't actually make a loss, it's too busy feeding corruption and subsidising municipalities. Uh, and maybe if one just has to do some uh, re-looking at the costings within and cross-subsidizations with, within ESCM 
we would resolve many problems. But I look forward to the panel's comments. Hi, my name is Tyrone. I represent a company called The Central Components here. Um, question for Tim. Tim, obviously, well, from my point of view, not obviously, um, blockchain has application in a number of other utilities. What is the timeline around government starting to give consideration to those utilities and the integration of blockchain and the potential privatization of those types of things, in your humble opinion? Um, so one of the things I didn't speak about um, when I gave the, the overview around blockchain is there's a principle of mining also involved, <clears throat> which is when every single time I submit a new entry into the distributed network, everyone needs to effectively update their record, which is a principle called mining. Now, mining is effectively a mathematical problem that you're trying to solve. And with any problem, the bigger the problem and the more complicated it is, and bearing in mind this is not just maths, it's cryptography, which is one of the highest levels of encryptions, you basically have to use a mass amount of computing power, uh, which is why you've heard crazy statistics like the amount of Bitcoin mining in the world is the equivalent of over 50 gigawatts of power. Um, I mean, that's more than the entire South Africa would use um, in terms of electricity. So it's a very intensive process in terms of actually mining and updating these records. Now, in a, in a scenario where we're getting um, metadata for the purposes of billing or for the purposes of um, grid management with renewables, and you're getting data, data sets once a month, that's 100% fine. Um, because your data size is per data point. So every meter, every inverter, you get kilobytes of data. But when you start compressing the frequency of that data to sub 30 minute interval data, and 30 minutes is the gold standard at the moment for billing because of time of use tariffing and the way that we are billed um, under the ESCOM tariff calendar, and in turn how the municipalities bill us as consumers, we start compressing that data interval even further down. Um, there's a statistic that IBM said, by going from um, monthly to daily meter reads, you're increasing the, the level of data intensity by 2,880%. So you massively, massively increasing the volumes of data. Now, if I come back to the earlier statement I made around the physical intensity of mining that data and updating the records, there are huge scaling limitations to that, um, which is why I, I genuinely believe that um, kind of taking blockchain in its current form and just adopting it um, in terms of, you know, kind of a more connected transactional smart grid is not the way to go. Um, there's been a lot of innovation with a whole bunch of other kinds of blockchain. So blockchain is obviously what came out as part of the, the Satoshi white paper and it literally has been running Bitcoin. But since then, all of these other cryptocurrencies have made their own um, adaptation of a blockchain um, a decentralized database. And that is to cope with some of these scaling limitations. So some of them kind of cache data and in packets so that you don't mind as you get data, you get you mine data in perhaps even monthly intervals because that's the frequency that you do need. Um, but it does cause um, still massive scaling issues and concerns. Um, so I hope that answers Jose's question. Jose says he's fine, he's showing me this. Uh, but would you mind uh, just dealing with Tyrone's one? Um, around the timelines and what do you think government's timelines are? <laughs> so, if you look at globally how government and regulation has been either pro or against blockchain and cryptocurrencies, you get a complete um, variety of different scenarios. Um, I think government in general is struggling to understand blockchain and the power of blockchain. I think reserve banks are, start, are struggling to understand cryptocurrencies and obviously the cryptocurrencies represent real threats to central reserve banks and we've seen stories like in Venezuela where people were throwing currency into the streets because the currency was worthless and they started adopting crypto because even though crypto is far more volatile um, it's in, it enabled a far more liquid and um, more sustainable base of currency exchange. So <clears throat> I think in general, anything to do with government regulation and blockchain is going to take a very, very long time. I think the South African Reserve Bank has been very proactive. They've been participating in a lot of community events and a lot of different ecosystems, and they've been very active, and that's my personal experience. Um, but I think the adaptation of blockchain in other utilities has still got a long way to go. I think the more likely application around blockchain, and I'm just talking off the top of my head here, 
will probably be very successful in utilities that are effectively far more less regulated than what electricity is. Um, it's quite ironic because if you look at electricity, you're basically talking about most regulated. Then you've got gas, which is slightly less regulated. You've got a whole bunch of nurse licensed energy traders that have got gas trading licenses. Then you look at water, where you've got a water supply um, provider, a WSP model, where that's even less regulated. And then you look at like telecoms and you know, that kind of like mass deregulation that's happened in that sector. So I think as you go down the chain to less regulated uh, utilities, there will be some form of use case. I can't hypothesize what, what that will be because I don't have experience in those sectors. But I definitely think that um, it takes government a whole lot longer just to wrap their heads around some of the limitations, some of the opportunities around blockchain. We're going to have, we probably have about 4 million customers that are probably not going to be served by the... It doesn't make economic sense to take the grid there. So, microgrids, mini grids, serves an ideal opportunity to serve in that space. The economics of it, I'm not so sure yet, but certainly for the basic needs of lighting and, uh, you know, I'd combine that with maybe uh, solar geysers, you know, you can serve a lot of the, you know, the comfort, the basic needs of households. And so I certainly would, I see a huge space for that. Eskom, in fact, have a, uh, a mini grid operating in the Fixburg area. Uh, it works. It, it, it's done professionally. And uh, so for future, future electrification, you know, there's this idea that we have to take the grid to every part of the country. When we have massive urbanization taking place, we have to seriously think about. But everybody does have the right to, to access to energy. But it doesn't have to be from a centrally generated plant. Right. So these models are going to play a significant role. And whether municipalities are prepared for it, I don't know. But certainly, the part that I've spoken about in terms of the, the future is more, where it's probably going to be the trading aspects, uh, having access to a grid and distributing that energy and having the reliability of, of you know, when your microgrid goes down and you can't generate that you actually still provide a, a reliable supply. These are things that we will have to work through. But certainly it has a place in, in, in our industry. The, the second question that was asked around uh, the, this, the economic growth issue. You see, we make a fundamental mistake when we do our energy planning because the mandate for the Department of Energy is really around security of supply. But what we're not looking at is really the issue of affordability of supply. I believe you need to do the, both the modeling. And now when you, we can have all the coal we want. Right? You'll have the security of supply, you, you can build <coughs> more power plants, but if the customer at the end of the day can't afford this thing, right, then we, we're starting to lose the plot. Because it, affordability has to, and it's linked back now to understanding our history as a country. Our economy grew and grew very, very well on the back of cheap coal, cheap electricity, so we have a very energy intensive country. Right? As soon as we try to build Madupi and Kusile to fund that uh, this thing, uh, capacity additions, we, we had to raise the tariff. Right? And as a result, by raising the tariff, and it's between 2008 and uh, 2018, you know, it was said that we probably had about a 300% increase in 500% increase in, in electricity, right? Now, when you look at productivity and production from an economics point of view, you are changing uh, the factors of production, energy cost, and, and, and in addition to that, our labor cost has been uh, moving uncontrollably out. Two issues is an absolute recipe for why we are sitting with low growth. Now, if we want to change this picture, we need to talk about 
how are we going to produce cheap energy in this country? Right? And that is the way the grid is going to play a critical role. We've seen, you know, the levelized cost of uh, renewables coming in at at uh, at uh, probably mm. 62, 70 cents <coughs> a kilowatt. And mm. this morning I told you on, on an inclining block tariff, somebody wants to charge me six rand. I mean, that's crazy. Uh, it's a recipe to get me off the grid. Right? So what's, what's this technology disruption that you're starting to see is causing the debt spiral, but it's also getting the more affluent customers off the grid. But a typical Santin guy who can afford uh, an, an addition to his bond of maybe 200,000 is just going to put on solar on his house and he's going to probably move off the grid. And what's going to happen is you're going to have the poor on the grid, right? And cutting and footing the bill between government and the poor, it's unsustainable. It will die. I certainly hope I've given some insight into that. And clearly our thinking has to change as to how we're going to get the electricity from 6 rand a kilowatt down to about 50, 60 cents because we have the resources. So it's just about innovation of how we do that. Yeah, just, on, just on that as well, your supply to the mines and that the, 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 the big thing there is... is uh, Reliability, of course, and it's got to be uh, low Delicious, cost. Yeah. Uh, now, we're in, we're in a fairly, um, you might say it's a good or bad position, but there's a lot of opportunity because a lot of the old coal stations now are, are going to be retired, which gives an opportunity now to bring in uh, lower energy. But as I said, you can't just have wind and solar because you've got to have all the rest of the stuff. You can't just have uh, eggs with uh, flour. You've got to have sugar and milk and all the rest of it. So the, 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 the trick now is to ensure that we either get gas in uh, to assist that, or we use the existing uh, existing plant to run a synchronous generator, so we change them <laughs> so that they can provide the inertia and the other and the other effects, and they can be spun by the by the wind at very low cost, so that you can get this kind of benefit. So the the the, the concept of the whether it's base mid merit or peaking in the past, you used to actually select generation sets to actually do that. Now what you're doing is you still actually have you've got to have that kind of component, but how you build that component up is not by, by specific gen sets. You could have it by uh, wind with, with backup gas, or you could have it by, with uh, wind with backup battery, or you could do something else. Um, so although the, 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 the actual uh, energy supply is, ends up the same, uh, how you actually get there is different. And that's going to be, be our challenge going, going forward. But fortunately, you've got a lot of uh, examples from around the world where they actually are going into that kind of area such as uh, Ireland and Denmark and so on and so forth. So we could actually learn from that to actually see how we can do that. One of the big things though is generally smaller and more flexible because of the uncertainties. So uh, that's why gas becomes so, so uh, uh, um, uh, really uh, promising because you can build these things really quickly two years, you've got it up, you've got it running in the right place and it gives you the full cake. So it's, it's that kind of thing that we'd need. We can't really go for these very large stations which take 12 years to build uh, because by the time you build them your whole scenario has changed. So it, we need to be dynamic, flexible and then make sure that we get the right sort of mix so that we can provide the provide the power. But as I say, the technology is there. We've just got to get the regulations in place and the um, ability to actually do that. And uh, uh, the, the one of the regulation things that they're using very effectively overseas is markets, where if you design the market properly, you'll get the investors in. So you don't have to go through this whole raising debt from the utility side. That's done from somewhere else. Duke Energy, State Grid, whatever, will invest to actually help you to, to do that. And uh, or um, national grid or something like that. So <laughs> those, those, uh, those facilities are, are available with far better balance sheets than Eskom's got. Um, so we need to actually start looking at how we can incentivize and get the right market and f financial framework that these guys can come in and actually um, uh, assist in, in getting this, uh, uh, the, 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 the power supply system actually sorted there. 
I think uh, the general picture of poverty in this country is real. And one of the key problems that if you look at us in South Africa and the rest of Africa, is that at least we still have money that is flowing through the system in taxes. But one of the things that uh, is an ailment for this country is to take off greed, greed, personal greed, and all this uh, uh, sort of looting from the fiscals. And then if you actually also look at the education system, it's falling apart. If you go to the rural areas, nothing has changed. Since 1994, the buildings are poorly attended to, there's no maintenance, there's lack of proper teacher, teachers. And in fact, all the surveys indicate about close to 66% of the teachers in various other provinces in the rural areas do not have metric, but they're teaching metric. And if you look at the municipalities, uh, the statistics that came from private garden was that uh, close to 83% of the senior managers in the municipalities did not have metric. So then you come up with this whole situation and scenario. You look at uh, the townships, uh, the data is extremely expensive. We are one of the highest paid nations in terms of data. And then if you look, we are captured. We are captured by service providers. And who has got an interest in these service providers? We can't move, we've not even rolled out uh, the, the level of, uh, of broadband that is required. South Africa was one of the first, taught the leading country in terms of uh, information technology. But now when you look at the cost, if you look at Kenya, the cost of data is nothing and people are moving in that direction. I used to sit in the round table with the president, Cyril Ramaphosa, on the Commonwealth side. And one of the things, we, we brought in Indians uh, to try to see if we can model the growth of uh, these hubs and, and, and follow the Indian model. But uh, I think somewhere it stopped in the cracks because, again, lack of education, access to electricity, and so forth. I think one of the key aspects that uh, I think the president has indicated also is that uh, if you move into high level of tourism, and we also invest in agriculture, try to move the population to go into this tourist industry and also put in agriculture with supportive systems like water, irrigation, uh, desalination processes. I think we'll go in a, in a, in a far, far, far better uh, level of, of, of economic uh, development and growth. Just look today, it was on the radio, Kiyani in, in Limpopo, a project to bring water to the, to the community. It started at around about 500,000. It ballooned to three billion. And the people still don't have water. And that is greed. And if we cannot solve the issue of greed, we are doomed as a country. We pray and hope that uh, the discovery of oil and gas will actually come very fast to us. At least it will be able to create growth. But again, if we are greedy, we will not succeed. So, thank you. Mr. Stovic, yours was a comment, right? It is a comment. It's a comment. Okay. All right, let's get questions. Um, yep. Cristina Listradescu from uh, Amicus Curiae, CIY. Uh, to keep in uh, this cocktail party with the ISCOM, which everybody's talking, and we're talking about the, something which everybody want to get out from the grid and uh, when the companies they try to do something whatever it's eolian it's um, whatever now i hear it about the taxation on all of this which they try to improve the electricity on day on. It's true because it's going to come the taxation on the company and in the private sector and on and on private people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, this, um, that's also a comment, right? 
Okay. Yes. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah. Hi. It's 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 Clyde. So yeah. I apologise. I do have a comment just to start with, and that is. When someone from a bank knows your first name, you're generally in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the other thing I wanted to say is actually a report back. Um, people will remember a month ago we had a seminar here, and I'm, I'm afraid to report that I still haven't got my meeting with Nursa. Uh, it's now been five months that I requested a meeting. So the question to the panel is with the regulatory constipation that we suffer in South Africa. Um, I now have had an application to do large-scale wind with storage sitting on the Minister of Energy's desk for over two and a half years and I haven't had a response. And I've, in desperation, given up and wanted to export energy because I'm not allowed to produce it locally and I need to speak to NURSA to find out what the rules and regulations are with regard to exporting, trading if you like, and I can't even get a meeting, let alone um, uh, a license. So the question to the panel is, how do we break this regulatory logjam and actually get things moving more sensibly? Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Chair. It, it, this is to... Um, Everybody on the on the panel. Can you get your name, sir? My name is Charles Murove. We do sustainability advisory. Thank you. Um, we seem to be a bit silent on on water. Uh, is this because we think it's unrelated or it's unimportant? Thank you. So my name is Brad. Um, I I would just like you know directed at Eskimia. My electricity bill at the end of the month is 3,700 Rand on average a month. I have a single phase supply, single home, and nothing fancy. At night, I leave outside lights on, the LED lights. I have hot water for my two children, and I cook with gas. Okay, 3,700 Rand a month. That means I have to earn 7,000 Okay, 400 rand a month to pay for tax before I can pay for my electricity. Okay, your average salary in South Africa, if you're lucky, is 4,000 rand a month. It's a national disgrace. Okay, Madubi and Kusile are a failure. And were they built under the context of a knee jerk reaction where we had load shedding and we didn't have enough power? Or were they built taking into account your average monthly cost of living and electricity? So these, these type of issues that have come out filter all the way back to pul coal pulverizers in Madupi being vertical instead of horizontal, being designed by international people and not our own skills within South Africa, being reliant on opinions and possibly failed engineering. If we work it all the way back, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a national failure, a disgrace. And how is Eskom going to rectify this without wiping the slate clean, getting rid of the corruption, the the improving on their skills. We can talk about smart grids and fourth industrial revolution, but let's go back to the basics and actually look at the people at the end that are using that technology and make it affordable for them. You have households in South Africa that have to walk five kilometers a day to go and get clean water, yet they've got electricity and they cannot afford the electricity so the municipalities have done their job with getting the power to those premises. It's now that cost of electricity that just puts it way out. And my 
appeal to Eskom is to really do something about this. It's it's unaffordable and industry cannot even survive. I mean, if you, if you look at your average Joe that's got a simple house that wakes up, you know, the guy wakes up, goes to work, comes home and tries to earn a living and just get on with life, it's, it's becoming virtually impossible. And for industry, the mining sector, the, the real um, drivers behind life and the economy, imagine how they're feeling. Imagine what's going through their minds. It's impossible for them to survive in this country and I urge Eskom to do something about it. Yeah, the <laughs> <laughs> you could say, yeah, nurse is actually pretty good if you compare with home affairs trying to get unabridged certificates. <laughs> but uh, I think the, the, that's why I was saying that the best thing for that is to try and get a market involved because then you don't get this permission per application which has to go through a huge bureaucracy. If you can get a, a, a well-designed market approved by the regulator, then the private sector can actually have deals between each other, between uh, suppliers and, and, and customers, as you would normally do, and you can deregulate it within a framework, and you can then have suppliers giving um, different kind of uh, generation solutions to customers having uh, different demand, res re demand requirements. And that can be done on a market basis, so the, the, uh, you have traders, you have aggregators, and uh, the price is set on an hourly basis or even quicker than that, and they bid into the market and they get their response and they can see the market uh, performance so that they can decide whether to go into the market or not. And uh, that, that's, that's, that's one area where I think around the world that they've, that they've actually freed up this uh, kind of uh, this uh, regulatory uh, sort of constipation where at the moment if you want to do anything you've got to get a, a license and a separate permission and, a, and a so on and so forth and it just actually bogs everything down. So you can have a, 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 a we've got gas applications that are just sitting, we can't, there's nothing that can be done. No, it's, it's, just, it's just sitting for years. And they just either don't want to make decisions or they can't, I don't know why. Um, but the, uh, the, if, if they had a framework where they can then stand back and they don't have to do that, and the framework and then the market then operates, that, that frees up a lot of, uh, a, a lot of ability for, for um, things to happen. So that, that's one way I would suggest. The issues when it comes to regulation, I too have had things at DOE and nurses' desk for many years. <coughs> and just never really moved <clears throat> and what I just organically did is just move past those opportunities because uh, my business wouldn't have survived. So it's just very unfortunate when you, again, you talk about private sector innovation, job creation, that when we become so dependent as an industry on regulation that you can actually kill quality businesses and quality projects. Um, what, I, what I will also say is that when it comes to um, energy trading, I'm just going to be very blunt, I really think that post unbundling of ESCOM, a lot of these things will change because right now, un outside of REAP, it is not in anyone's interest from a government stakeholder perspective to open up a more freely open energy market. Um, I've worked very closely with the only licensed energy trader in the country um, and even they have a lot of challenges still. So I really think that when we talk energy trading, um, the piece of paper is not the key. There are a whole bunch of other um, components that you also need to align, both on a distribution level and a transmission level. Um, but from a private sector point of view, I think it will take some time. And for me, probably that catalyst moment is the unbundling of ESCOM. Okay, thanks. Charles asked us a very pertinent question uh, to which I said, ouch. Says we, we have said nothing about water. Is it because we don't think it's important? Okay. We, we just we're not taking water. <laughs> so water water is certainly our next nexus uh, this morning's uh, as I was driving in here it was reported in the news that we lose up to 60 percent of the water that we have in our country and yet we are a water water challenge water scarce country now how we distribute and how we articulate has to change. We're going to have to have to smarten that system. We're going to have to introduce. Uh, we have to account for the for the water, which we're not doing at the moment. And we have to, you know, it, it's it's about 
understanding from the intakes to what's being distributed and doing that water balance across that space and then going after and fixing up the problems. It's very important. I think the, the lessons out of Cape Town and what happened in Cape Town uh, two years ago <coughs> is very likely to happen in our country. El Nino is there. Uh, we're going to have it for a, a few more years. And uh, we're going to have to deal with this very, very smartly. Yeah. <coughs> what I will say on that topic is that <coughs> when you talk ICT infrastructure and connectivity and digitizing the networks, that also applies to water. And a lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the, the technology itself can be applied across water, gas, and electricity. So there definitely should be a unified approach. It again, talks to the topic of interoperability. Um, when you are a consumer, you have multiple utility providers. How amazing would it be if you could unify you, your utilities with a central account in a central app? Yeah. Um, and I really think that a lot of the, the problems and the solutions that we spoke through today can be applied. Um, what goes without saying, obviously water doesn't fall under the definition of a smart grid, because uh, grid is copper cables in the ground. <coughs> um, so what we often refer to as water is uh, smart utility networks, because uh, it becomes and catches a much broader utility infrastructure. But the software and the way that you build and the way that you engage and have relationships with your customers from a technology point of view should be identical. And then there was the question from Brad. Um, I think Brad was referring to you, Minash, but I'm not sure. Sorry. <laughs> he was talking mm -hmm. about the, um, the high prices that he has to pay yes. in his house and, and how um, the Kusile and, and the other one uh, does not come up to the party. And Yeah. <laughs> so Let's go. I'm not sure who's taking it. See you. can give some comment on that. Okay. okay. Do you want me to? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, I think uh, the frustrations there are, are, are I think they, they, they felt with everybody. I don't think you're the only one that feels a bill's too high. But that, if I could just say that, uh, you know, hindsight's an exact science. So if you look back what went wrong, you can actually say, well, OK, we should have done ABC. But what they really should have done was start building in 98 and not wait till 2004, which was a big botch up and get rid of all your expertise between the two periods because you're never going to build another station again. So that was, that was I think, one of the, th the big problems. And then the, uh, the issues of the international guys, which should really be really good, uh, didn't come up to scratch. Um, so there, there, were, there were a lot of things, but that's not an excuse. I think the, uh, the, 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 the issues now is um, how, can they, how can they go forward? And... Um, I think I think what is uh, what what we should realise is that uh, it's not only the, the, the sort of the, the, the big areas in Eskom at the moment. When you call Eskom, Eskom is actually three areas: is really wires, and then the big problems have been in generation, um, and and that's really where they've sort of the Eskom, the load shedding, all that's been an Eskom issue, has been generation. Uh, whereas the wire side is is um, still functioning pretty well. The problem is that the that the generation side now is actually starting to pull down the wire side due to lack of funding and all the rest of it. So the one of the good things I think um, is that although unbundling itself uh, might not be the solution, at least it gives a separation between, and you can actually now start focusing properly on the wire side, so that you don't actually start cutting too far there and sinking them as well. Um, and then on the generation side, I think what's what's positive is if they can allow the a lot more of private participation coming in. And as I said, more flexible participation in getting generation in uh, fairly quick and fairly low cost uh, generation. I, I, I don't think it's the solution to try and build another Madupi myself. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, with the, the amount of if we can get the energy, low energy renewables coming in with the uh, gas support or with other kind of storage support plus synchronous generation, I think we'll have a, a, a good mix. But we've got to have the right framework and, and market to entice investors to come in. But I'm quite encouraged to see that there is some kind of a will looking into that direction. So although it's not a solution, there, there's no silver bullet, I think it'll take time, but at least I think we're not going down the same path of the um, sort of large scale, very expensive type of 
uh, uh, generation and, and just pursuing that route with nothing else. So that, that's one encouraging factor. And I think government are realizing that there, that there are solutions out there that we need to start, start looking at, which is like somewhat different to what we're doing now. Maybe just to add to that, I, I also believe that our regulation environment is doing it using the wrong methodology. Uh, we regulate ESCOM on a cost plus basis. That, and for me, I can remember my professor at business school telling me that's a blank check. You, you don't instill efficiency in the system. So we should rather move to pos possibly consider other options like maybe even price cap. Where, and that will force efficiency in the, in the system. It will bring costs down. And then added to the colleagues uh, Tim's discussion, competition. Competition will change the picture. Okay, um, I'd like to thank you all, um, the panelists, but just give you a few moments, uh, two minutes just to wrap up your thoughts and uh, um, just to remind you that between you and food, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll start. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think the one real exciting thing around all of this innovation is that it really puts the, the customer at the forefront. Um, and to that last comment by Brad and to what Manish was saying, um, putting the customer forefront with supported regulation basically means far more competition, reliable service, which will mean energy security, competitive pricing, and a far more robust um, customer service offering. If you just look at how the telco sector has evolved from SMS and voice and just being able to finance a handset to getting a whole bunch of value-added services like you subscribing, getting your show max with your subscription, I think a lot of the similarities will happen in the energy sector. And I think the real opportunity and one of the big, um, big evolutions of all of us is that it will really be very customer-focused. Um, and if you think about all of us as consumers <coughs> right now, and uh, if I were to ask you, do you trust your utilities provider? I'm pretty certain most of you would say no. Um, and I think that will change in the future, and that's what I'm really excited about. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, and to uh, just maybe pick up on, um, on Brad, but I think the, the general tone and it's our sort of national feeling of one of uh, pessimism and seeing the problems in, in a very stark um, a, a kind of relief. We see the problems in our country and they're huge. But um, it um, kind of interested me a couple of months ago to have people come across and visit me from South America. And they were uh, hearing about all our problems. And their comment was, uh, you guys are crazy. You've, you've got so much going for you compared to the problems we're sitting with. And I think we tend to be very self-critical as a country. And we, we, we uh, beat ourselves up a lot. And I think we should maybe try and look at some of the positives to see things that we're doing well. And, and kind of understand the, the positives we sit with. And there, it's um, kind of not a case of saying, let's um, do the old stuff properly. I think let's embrace this new technology and the kind of exciting things and the innovators and the, and the young people in our midst to have this sort of energy and vision and give them oxygen and help them to kind of do things differently. And maybe the way we solve our problems is not by doing the same things better, the same old thing better, but then but look for new solutions. So I think my feeling is let's be optimistic and let's look at the, at the, the bright side of things and uh, try to do things really well. Thank you, Prof. Remind me of the song. Oh, you're going to the Yes. So for me, technology is a critical enabler for change. It can, it will, uh, I'm 100% I'm sure that the issues that we have faced, we can sort out. 
We have capable engineering in the country still to be able to deal with the issues. The problem is though, is the political will. And I'm going to borrow from uh, what Praveen Gordon, Minister then of Finance, you know, when he was challenging the, the, the whole Gupta regime, he said, guys, we have to have active citizenry because we can change this picture. And unless we become active citizens and not accept the bullshit that we are, we are fed every day, we are not going to deal with this problem and it's not going to go away quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Minesh. Um, we have a new vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just to, uh, my view is I'd like to uh, echo what was said about, about being positive. We, there's a, we, 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 we've got problems, but the, the fortunate thing that I think, um, the opportunities that we have, is that the, uh, the, 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 the trials on the, on the technologies and the markets have been around for 25 years now. So in the US, they've had markets for 25 years in Europe. They know exactly what the impacts are and so on. So we have been rather fortunate in holding back. Technologies that are coming forward now um, are fairly well tested, and we know more or less how, they, how we can fit them in. So we've actually got the building blocks to actually try and solve the issues. And I think one of the big other positive opportunities is the is this hydrogen economy, which is, I think, going to pick up. And the benefit of South Africa, of course, it's blessed with a lot of sun and wind, which we can actually then start using this to our benefit, not only for our own storage transport, but also export. And it's, it's one of the industries which I think uh, it, it's something which we can have a win-win. So you can get your generation surplus hydrogen uh, when it's not surplus grid feed. There's, there's so much opportunity that we can look at there. But the other thing is, of course, looking at the regulatory side, we've got to free that up. And it's not only Eskim, it's got to be the Munichs as well. We've spent, I think, 25 years trying to sort out this EDI. Uh, and young engineers came in and they retired before it was solved. <laughs> and, and it's still not solved. And as Manesh was saying, there's a constitution issue and there's a subsidy issue. But it's not, a, it's not rocket science. I think it can be solved. But we need to actually enable, the, empower the Munichs, enable them to get their subsidies, and then get um, some effective private DSOs in with aggregators on the market side to, in fact, uh, enable the, 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 the distribution side, in fact, also to, to, to take off. So I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. I think, I think we've got the building blocks of solution, and I think we're now starting to get the will because of perhaps of the past non-successes. Um, and and I, think, I think that's going to be a good thing. So I'm actually uh, quite excited about it. Thank you.